Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malu Dumim in Israel. There are many differences among human beings, some more glaring than others. Differences of sex, sexual orientation, race, religion, height, intelligence, hair color, eye color, and preferences of ice cream flavors are among these differences. It is not unusual that some of these differences result in strife and hatred, to say nothing of killing and war. This is an unfortunate consequence of these vast differences, and it is something that stands at the pinnacle of what we should be trying to correct in ourselves. But there are also vast similarities between human beings. We all have the same genetic building blocks in our bodies. We all have the similar shapes and more or less similar functioning minds. We all eat and sleep and think and chill. These are very basic similarities that are built into our very selves. They are part and parcel of who we are. But there is another virtually universal similarity between human beings that rarely gets mentioned with those others. In fact, it rarely gets mentioned at all. It is simply taken for granted as a universal fact of human life and left as such. We all have it and would be shocked if somebody didn't have it. In fact, we would hardly know what to do with such a person. What is this universal feature of humanity that isn't as natural as those others mentioned earlier? It is the very human and very personal practice of having a name. We all have names. We are given these names at birth, but sometimes change them, change them as we go through life. We may have first names and last names and nicknames and married names and title names and perhaps different names in different languages. This is such an accepted feature of our lives that we cannot imagine things being otherwise. But it is also pretty artificial and somewhat arbitrary. There is usually nothing inherently meaningful about our names, but they are nevertheless among the most meaningful things about our view of ourselves. In fact, they are one of the most defining features of our very identity, both to ourselves and to others. This week's Parsha is called Lech Lecha. That two-word phrase means go for yourself or something along those lines. It is the first words recorded in the Bible of some form of prophetic communication between God and Abraham. These words initiated God's instructions to Abraham to leave his homeland and to travel to another land in which his name and almost otherworldly reputation would be established. He would found a great nation there and would be a source for blessing among all peoples of the world. As amazing as it sounds, all this came to be in a manner that almost defies explanation. In the course of his otherwise somewhat mundane comings and goings in this Parsha, he is confronted by famine, by war, by property issues with his nephew who traveled with him, and with the very biblical problem of childlessness. In the midst of all that, there is not one, but two distinct covenants with God. The first seems to be a reiteration of the initial promise God made to him before leaving his homeland, with the addition of the destiny that his descendants would have to undergo exile and suffering in another land. This was the foretelling of the slavery and oppression the Israelites would suffer in Egypt hundreds of years in the future. Included in this prophetic fate was the fact that he would have descendants. Up to this point, he had none. In another very biblical saga, his wife, who was called Sarai, told him to take her maid, Hagar, as a second wife so that he should have an alternate avenue for fathering offspring. When this alter alternative proves successful, Sarai seems to regret her permission and blames Abraham for her misfortune. In the course of this drama, she insists that Abraham drive the maid out of the encampment and into the desert. While wandering out there, Hagar is told by an angel that she would indeed bear a son who, who she was to call Ishmael, who would be the ancestor of the great nation of Ishmaelites. Through the end of this week's Parsha, Ishmael would be Abraham's only child. But there is one more covenant that Abraham takes on with God. This comes at the end of the Parsha. It is, it is the covenant of circumcision, one of the oldest religious practices in the world and one of the defining features of Judaism. In addition to the basic commandment, which was to circumcise all males of Abraham's household, it also included his extended tribe of neighbors. To this day, the practice has continued among both Jews and Muslims, who themselves are the spiritual heirs of Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and one of the first he circumcised. But there is one other feature of the second covenant that is frequently overlooked with all the focus on physical circumcision. This is the changing of names. 
The Torah makes no secret of the fact that Abraham's name was not originally Abraham. It was pronounced Avram, which was comprised of four Hebrew letters, unlike Abraham, which has five. The addition of the single Hebrew letter He as the fourth letter accounts for this difference in pronunciation. The names are fairly similar and even somewhat interchangeable in Jewish circles, but there is no question that they are different names. Sarai's name was also changed to the well-known Sarah by switching, or Sarah, by switching one Hebrew letter for another. The verses which describe these name changes are significant and should be examined. Quote, God spoke to him saying, Here is my covenant with you. You shall be a father of many nations. Your name shall no longer be called Avram, but shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. A little later, the name changed to Sarai comes up. Quote, And God said to Abraham, Sarai, your wife, do not call her name Sarai, for her name is Sarah or Sarah. And I have blessed her, and I shall give you to you a son through her, and I will bless her, and she shall be the ancestress of kings, and nations will come through her. It is unclear why these name, ch name changes were necessary. In both of the earlier promises to Avram that he would have countless descendants and that nations would come from him, he was never told to change his name. If the name change was so essential, shouldn't it have been implemented right off the bat to get things going? There is a gap of about 25 years between the first prophecy and the covenant of circumcision. Why did God wait so long to tell him to change his name and his wife's name? On top of that, Avram already had a son, Ishmael, proving that changing his name was not necessary to become a father. Finally, we have to wonder what changing a name has to do with having a child to begin with. Biologically, it makes no sense. So what was the purpose of these name changes? Although this veers from the traditional Jewish explanation, perhaps the truth is that the name change had nothing to do with being able to have a child. There was never meant to be any connection between the two. The verses themselves don't really show any direct link between them. They simply state that in the course of this covenant of circumcision, both Avram and Sarai would change their names. All the rest about having a son and being the ancestors of kings and nations was nothing more than reinforcing of the earlier promises. So why were their names changed? This takes us into the realm of speculation. There is no question that in the biblical world, the name of a person bore great significance, considerably more than names do now. It was not unusual that a person's name included some reference to a deity. The various names for God were frequently incorporated into biblical names. Interest, interestingly, this is not the case with any of the patriarchs or matriarchs of the early Bible stories. None of them has a name that depicts something about God's greatness or some other quality. They are all actually quite mundane. For instance, the name Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, is based on the fact that both of them laughed upon hearing that Sarah would conceive a son, uh, conceive a son in her old age. Jacob's name has something to do with the word for heel, which he was found grasping on his twin brother as he emerged right after him from the womb. In the case of Abraham and Sarah, their names seem to have something to do with their destiny as founding figures of great nations. The name Sarah, Sarah does mean a female minister or ruler. With Abraham, the addition of that letter spells out a kind of acronym that he would indeed be the ancestor of many nations. Perhaps these name changes were necessary to set that destiny in motion, as if God needed it to make things work out the way they were meant to. But perhaps there is another explanation that hits home on a more personal level. It wasn't the meaning of the name after the change that mattered, as much as the very fact that the names were changed. Each of them had to realize and internalize that they could become different people by this simple and slight alteration of their identity. They would no longer be that old couple who couldn't produce a child together. There was no better way of inculcating this awareness than by changing their names. To some degree, we are identified with our names. They are the single facet given to us during our lifetime that sticks with us throughout our lives. We are given it at birth and it is right there on our tombstone at death. We hear it many times every day and think of ourselves as intrinsically linked with this arbitrary sound. It truly becomes a part of us. 
like our brain or our personality. When it is changed for whatever reason, we cannot help but sense a profound shift in who we are. Though it is no more than a kind of belief, it acts as a solid anchor in determining who we are and how we see ourselves. Abraham and Sarah had to go through this process of changing their names and thus their identities. They had to see themselves as different people if they were to be able to be the subjects of God's promise to produce a child through them. When we are stuck in the old, we cannot grasp the new. Even though it was just a slight change to what is nothing more than a made-up sound, it could affect them in a, like a wake-up call to a new life. The way we see ourselves is, in a sense, who we are. It is never too late to look in the mirror and see a different person. Shabbat Shalom.